It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by EmailRevealer.com. Go to EmailRevealer.com and we can uh, check out the online infidelity investigation. Uh, you can give us your spouse's, your boyfriend's email address. We can trace it to online dating websites. Also check out OppermanReport.com. Go to OppermanReport.com and we have a lot of uh, exclusive content. We have a lot of shows on there that you won't find live on Friday night or Saturday night. Exclusive content. And also we're uploading a lot of exclusive documents, court documents and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, we got some from our guest here today, Montgomery Blair Sibley. Okay, now this is the story of uh, Deborah Palfrey, the D.C. madam. This is her attorney, and this is the man who has the, the list. He's got in his possession the phone bill, uh, the Verizon phone records of the D.C. madam. Mr. Sibley, are you there? Yes, sir, and thank you for having me on your show. Thank you again. Thank you again for coming on the show. Now, who is Montgomery Blair Sibley? Tell us about yourself. Well, uh, I'm almost 60 years old. I practiced law since 1981. Uh, grew up in New York, uh, upstate New York, Rochester. Went to law school and went to work at the district attorney's office where I was a prosecutor for five years. After that, I went into private practice. I migrated to Miami, Florida. And uh, in the early 2000s, started representing uh, escort agencies who had their assets seized by government agencies up and down the eastern seaboard. Okay, now that's interesting. Now, did you become involved with uh, Ms. Palfrey uh, before she was arrested or after she was arrested? Well, it was before she was arrested because there were two stages in her prosecution by the federal government. I had actually written her, as I did everybody who's had their assets seized in a certain way by the government, and said, I'm representing escort agencies on the East Coast, and it would be helpful to my clients and to you if I could speak to your attorney about your case, because if we share information, it would benefit both our clients. And that's when uh, I first reached out to her individually, and she responded that she did not have an attorney at that point. And that's when I became involved with her in October of 2006. Okay, but when you uh, became uh, in contact with her, she was already under some kind of police uh, involvement, or, or this is before? No, that's a good question, and I need to just back up a second and explain how it works with the federal government. Often they will go into court and get an order to seize somebody's assets, claiming those assets are the fruits of a criminal enterprise. And that's what happened in Gene's case. In October of 2006, the government, having completed an investigation that lasted well over a year, got a judge in California to order the seizure of Gene's house, all her bank accounts and the contents of the house, and that's the warrant of uh, arrest in REM, it's called technically, that they executed on her house in mid-October 2006. Very interesting. So the federal government conducts their own investigation, goes to a judge, and gets an order that they're allowed to seize your, your assets without a trial, before a trial. Exactly right. And it's a very strange procedure. It's called forfeiture, in this case, civil forfeiture, and later criminal forfeiture. But it's an instance in American law when you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And this became your specialty in some way. Now, how did you first get involved in that? Well, living in Miami as I did okay. in the 90s, uh, that was a huge drug capital of the world, as most people know, and obviously uh, along with that goes the money laundering. And so the government was seizing a million dollars in cash a week at the Miami airport and seizing over $300 million a year in assets like real estate, businesses, cars, planes, boats. So it was a very a busy forfeiture market in which I was practicing and became quite an expert in that area of the law at the time. Okay, now that, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Now, okay, so now you get in touch with Ms. Palfrey. What was your first impression? Well, like most uh, clients, she was mystified, terrified, uh, 
didn't know what was going on, thought it was very unfair. And uh, so we you know, spent a fair amount of time just educating her on what was going on and what the course of the prosecution of her was going to look like. And that, how did you respond to the government in order to protect her assets? Well, initially she came to Washington, D.C. Remember, she lived out in Vallejo, California, and her escort agency was operating out of the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. So she came to D.C. to meet with me, and we uh, outlined our initial response, which was to challenge the seizure of the property. And that's when these phone records surfaced for the first time. Now, were you successful in uh, preventing the seizure of her property? No, the property had already been seized. Now, understand okay. that they seized the property first, then there's an adjudication, which can include a jury trial, and ultimately the government proves that you're guilty, you have to prove you're innocent, and the chips fall where they may at the end of that proceeding. So we were just at the beginning phases of that civil forfeiture proceeding when she uh, and I first were in contact. Okay, but ultimately, were you ever uh, successful in reversing that civil forfeiture proceeding? No, because Jean insisted, and I would just call her Jean Palfrey. Her full name was Deborah Jean Palfrey. But Jean insisted that we fight vigorously against the civil forfeiture. And having done that, the government turned around and then indicted her criminally for running a racketeering influence corrupt organization known as RICO and money laundering and uh, operating a prostitution enterprise. Did you warn her against that? Did you think that might have happened? Well, we absolutely did. It's a typical tactic of the government. They yeah. seize your assets, and if you fight them, then they turn around and indict you, so you lose not only your property, you lose your liberty as well. First they take your money, then when you complain, they arrest you. Exactly right, <laughs> and she was very feisty and wasn't going to give up without a fight. And uh, knowing the consequences, she was willing to go forward and, in fact, did, and that became, uh, began a two-year prosecution, or I should say about a year and a half prosecution uh, of her that ultimately resulted uh, in her being found dead in, on uh, May 1st, 2008. Right. But before we get to that, now, 2006, how old was she in 2006? 52 years old. 52 years old. Now, was she married or... or, or... No, I mean, I'll give you a brief background on her. Yeah. She uh, went to high school in Pennsylvania, migrated out to San Diego, uh, started law school out there, took a cocktail waitressing job to support herself. Ultimately, the law school did not pan out. The cocktail waitressing job turned into a prostitution job. She was very bright and began to organize the prostitutes into an escort agency out in San Diego. About a year and a half into that activity in 1992, she was arrested, pled guilty, and uh, after some rigmarole, ultimately spent about a year and a half in California State Prison for her role in that San Diego prostitution escort service. Oh, so she had been arrested previously in 92. And Correct. And upon being released, uh, she had nobody in her life, and she immediately set up a new escort service, this time in Washington, D.C., and after about six months on the ground here in Washington, D.C., she relocated back to California and ran the escort service from there uh, remotely, quite frankly, just by telephone interviews and mail. Now, what made her pick D.C.? Do you know? Well, organ organized crime controls most of the escort services on the eastern seaboard, uh, except the District of Columbia is a island of non-organized crime activity because we have 32 different police forces in the metropolitan D.C. area, and it just is not an attractive place to try to run organized crime. So it sort of was a unplaned uh, area for escort services at the time. And I suppose the organized crime wouldn't want to compete with the greatest uh, organized criminals of the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll either uh, confirm or deny the truth of that statement, but I tend to hear what you're saying. Yeah, hey, come on, you know. The biggest gang in town. Okay. Not really? I know. Well, this is just fascinating. I'm learning so much already of brand new stuff that I did not know. Okay. Now, so she starts this operation in D.C. Now, was it immediately successful, or, or did she have some kind of, uh, some kind of a, an angel or a godfather come in there and help her out? No, no. She ran this whole thing on her own starting in 1994. 
and it quickly ramped up to a very successful operation with between 20 and 30 escorts working for her. And, uh, you know, she was a very bright woman, very highly organized, uh, would have been a master's of business administration uh, candidate easily if she wanted to uh, devote her time to that. And uh, very quickly, from 1994 until October of 2006, she was doing very, very well and had amassed uh, uh, savings of about $4 million from the profit from her activity during her work during that time. Now, now, when you hear about some of these other escorts, there are so, uh, stories there in D.C., like I had Henry Vincent on the show. Um, there's an element of blackmail uh, going on in the background. Was she ever involved in anything like that? To my knowledge, she was not involved in blackmail because she never knew who her customers were. She never met them. All she had was a telephone number, and that was the end of it. I mean, she knew who her escorts were because she vetted them very carefully, required them to fill out applications and provide driver's licenses and all that. But uh, she never had the means to blackmail any clients because she didn't know who they were. And from what I understood from talking to the escorts and Jean, uh, they never had any interest in, never engaged in that sort of behavior as well. Okay, gotcha. So now she gets, first she has the problem with that they're trying to seize her assets. Now they charge her criminally. Uh, were you part of the criminal defense? I'm sure you were. Well, let me just back up a little bit yeah. and explain how that uh, trajectory occurred. What happened was when the Keystone Cop police raided Jean's house in October of 2006, they seized all the assets they could find related to the prostitution service, her computer, a lot of the files she kept on the escorts, uh, various notebooks she had, and left untouched by these police were two cookie jars that had about $50,000 in cougar rands and boxes in the basement for them that said telephone records, Pamela Martin and Associates. 1994 through 2006. Just as an aside, the name of her escort service was called Pamela Martin and Associates uh, in, in the District of Columbia area. So once I got in contact with Jean and learned of the existence of the telephone records, I immediately had her uh, UPS those to me in my office here in Washington, D.C. The reason being, I assumed sooner or later the police would come back for them, and I wanted to make sure I had them and the government didn't. So when we went in to negotiate the settlement of the – go ahead. No, no, no. I, I'm listening. Okay. So when we went in to negotiate the settlement of the civil forfeiture charge and Gene was willing to give up some money, uh, maybe a million of the $4 million they had seized, I said, look, if this goes forward, I have the telephone numbers and will be able to identify the clients of this escort service for the last 14, 13 years in the District of Columbia, and as a result, you're going to cause a lot of pain and suffering for something that actually is not even a crime in the District of Columbia, because prostitution was illegal in the District of Columbia until uh, late 2006. Uh, the response of the government was no, and uh, we're going to indict her, and they did. So yes, the criminal charges came out in the uh, January, February of 2007, and I represented her on those charges uh, almost up until the trial of the matter in uh, April of 2008. Now, was it common in your practice back at that time to be able to negotiate like that and say, listen, okay, you want $4 million, we'll give you a million, everybody goes their own way? And that's a great question, and that's the odd thing. Understand, I've done literally hundreds of forfeiture cases, dozens of them related to escort agencies, and the end result is the government just wants a big chunk of cash right. and lets everybody walk away, particularly in the escort side because they're not there to make anybody unhappy. They're just shaking people down in a legal way, if you will. So the fact that they were so unreasonable and then turned around and indicted her rather than just litigate out the civil forfeiture charges was anomalous. It was unusual in my experience in that world. Okay, now that's interesting. Now, why do you think that is? you think it was because it was D.C., or do you think it was because you were in possession of those phone records? I think the original motivation for this prosecution was purely political. And understand, this prosecution originated out of Baltimore when they began tracking 
express mail envelopes to one P.O. box in California, and that was Gene's escorts going to the post offices, buying money orders for Gene's share of any uh, appointment the escort had, and then putting the money order in an express mail envelope and sending it to Gene's P.O. box. The large number of express mail envelopes going to one P.O. box triggered a U.S. Postal Service computer tracking software and alerted an investigator from the post office that there was money laundering going on because that was a typical money laundering profile behavior. That resulted in the backtracking of who owned the post office box in California, that being Gene, and who was buying these money orders, that being the escorts in the metro D.C. area. So all that matured into January of 2006 with a full report from the post office saying to the attorney general in Baltimore, I'm sorry, the U.S. attorney in Baltimore, prosecute this case. In February of 2006, the U.S. attorney in Baltimore said, no, nah, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do it. And that was the end of the matter. But then all of a sudden in October in 2006, the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia picks up the case and runs with it uh, anew, and that's where the whole case started. So I think there were deep political motivations for this case going forward. Regrettably, I only can speculate because we were not allowed to get the information that would have answered that question this positively. Uh, what, what information were you looking for? Well, I believed that Gene's service was being used for uh, national security reasons. That is, they were monitoring her escorts, monitoring the people. It's called a honeypot uh, in, in spy parlance. And uh, if the escorts themselves didn't know about it or Gene didn't know about it, they were being watched, watched with who they were, were having these uh, affairs or assignations with. Uh, also, remember October 2006, the Republicans were in a panic about losing uh, the House, and they may have been looking for dirt on Democratic candidates they could have embarrassed. And that was another reason for this rather odd prosecution and raiding of her house, et cetera, et cetera, that went all wrong when they forgot to take the phone records, and I got hold of them. Okay. Now, it seems to me that uh, when you discuss how they were tipped off by purchasing these uh, money orders and, and then sending them all this express mail to the same P.O. box, uh, I'm assuming that they were buying these money orders like in the amount of like $9,000. Was it something along that line? No, sir, because she charged about $350 for a one-hour date with an escort. Okay. And of that $350, she got $150. An escort would have typically four or five appointments a week, and so they'd be sending Gene between five and $800 at the end of every week by an express mail envelope. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't the money being large. It was the fact that there were large number of envelopes going to one uh, P.O. box in Vallejo, California, from the D.C. metro area. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. And, and then, uh, now, then you say – that you believe there, there was an intelligence operation that they were spying on her and spying on the escort and spying on the cl clients. But if, if that's the case, then why wouldn't they, rather than um, arrest her, just say, hey, Gene, well, yeah, come on in. We want to talk to you. You're going to work for us from now on. Well, you uh, imagine, Ed, that this is a monolithic government. But it's not. It's okay. more like an octopus with tentacles. So it's not necessarily clear that one tentacle understands or agrees or isn't actually in a battle with another tentacle around here. And when you have a White House at that time highly politicized by Karl Rove and trickling down into a Department of Justice, which prosecuted six times more Democrats for government waste and fraud than Republicans, uh, you have an entirely different kind of landscape for where, where this kind of uh, political prosecution can go forward. Now, understand there were some very sympathetic responses from the intelligence community as this went forward, but again, those were shot down in due course. Oh, how did they uh, uh, raise their head? How did that come up? Well, understand that Al Awaki was a terrorist, a Muslim terrorist, who uh, met with the bombers who flew into the World Trade Centers on, on 9-11. And he was a frequent user of Gene's escort service. And so after every assignation, the um, FBI agents who were trailing Alawaki around the D.C. metropolitan area would meet with the escorts and debrief them on his behaviors and, and gather information to ultimately humiliate and, uh, you know, reveal what kind of a hypocrite he was to be preaching this uh, holy Islamic uh, 
Koran code, but then practicing just the opposite behavior uh, in his private life. So when we began subpoenaing the records from the National Security Agency, the Department, um, the CIA, the FBI, the, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and half a dozen more agencies, most of them, Ed Kennedy, most people have never even heard of around here, we were getting feedback that they were welcoming the subpoenas because they'd be able to tell us things that would help Gene's case. Okay, now I wasn't aware of anything about this Alawaki guy. Now the girls who were visiting him, uh, then they, then they start getting picked up by the FBI. And they want to talk over these agents, whatever. Now were they reporting that back to uh, to Gene or, or no? That's what Jean told me, that she understood that sometimes they would be talking to um, agents after the fact. Okay. But that's why she was left alone for 13 years. Remember, not one time in 13 years and with over 10,000 dates uh, during that period was there ever an arrest or any sort of criminal prosecution of her or, or her women at any time. So they were left uh, almost intentionally alone to operate here. Uh, certainly with the full knowledge of the government for, for a large period of time. And, and in your experience, you haven't found that to be unusual, right? Usually these escort services, they're also involved in uh, tipping off the cops. Uh, in other cities that I've been involved with, it, there is a fair amount of scratching each other's back right. and other things going on between the escorts and the, uh, the police agencies. And, and a lot of blackmail, too. Have you noticed that, too, in, in, in other cases besides this one? Well, I got to tell you, there is a continuum of prostitution enterprises from the unfortunately cracked out streetwalker up to various levels of organized crime to the very high end, which consider it a profession and treat it as such with uh, ethical standards that are higher than doctors or lawyers, as far as I've uh, seen in, in my experience. So on that continuum, yes, there can be some sleazy behavior. But for Jean's escort service, she only you know, recruited and employed uh, really very intelligent, usually college-educated women. And those women were in it for whatever reasons, for periods of four to eight months typically, and then would cycle out and new women would cycle in. So, uh, no, I never saw the blackmail from Jean's perspective or the women she worked uh, for her. Okay. Now, you got your hands. I, I heard these phone records described at 40 pounds of phone records. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It took a hand cart to bring him into my office when they arrived uh, uh, with the UPS driver. And, uh, you know, whenever you had a, a, a phone, uh, you get a phone bill at the end of the month. And because Jean was in California, it was a long distance call every time a client or an escort called her. As a result, the phone number that was calling her showed up on the bill. And this was particularly true after 2000 when people started using cell phones rather than calling from their hotel rooms or private residences or businesses to set up the, uh, the dates with Gene's escorts. So now how, that's a, a, a huge undertaking to process all these phone bills. How did you handle that? Well, we didn't have any resources. Right. Obviously, the government had huge resources, but they didn't have the phone records. So initially, I partnered with uh, ABC News, uh, an investigative journalist reporter named Brian Ross, and made a deal with him. I would give him 2,000 phone numbers in exchange for him sharing with us the identity of the people, the identities of the people he identified from those phone numbers, because he had the resources to reverse look up phone numbers uh, that we just didn't have, because basically it was just Gene, myself, and my nine-year-old son working at that point in time. Well, okay. that was very uh, enterprising of you there. You hook up with ABC News, you tell them, okay, we'll give you 2000 at a time, they're going to break the numbers for you and come back. Now, did you find anything juicy in there? Well, the, the answer is, did ABC News find anything juicy? They weren't sharing it back uh, with you? We, well, this is what happened. Okay. Uh, they found a lot of information, uh, particularly, ultimately, we learned Senator David Vitter, who was a U.S. senator at the time, uh, Harlan Ullman, who was a, um, a shock and awe uh, person for the Department of Defense. He designed that shock and awe um, battlefield plan for them. And then Randall Tobias, who was head of the U.S. Uh, AID, which is one of the largest um, economic aid internationally organizations in Washington, and as everyone knows, is a front for most of the CIA activities uh, that come out of Washington, and dozens and dozens of others. But when it came time for Brian Ross to air his report, 
something happened we don't know, but ultimately the the 20 minute report on uh, ABC News uh, ended in hardly anyone actually being identified. And Brian ultimately would not tell us who he found. And that uh, created something of a panic because now we had invested and got no return with Brian Ross and ABC News. Yeah, I could imagine. Now, this, this USAID guy, right, that you said it was the front for the CIA, how often did his number appear in there? Was this a frequent flyer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, he liked to have more than one escort at a time at his little parties, which he later insisted he was only getting massages for. Okay. But, uh, yeah, he, they, it was on more than – it was multiple occasions, uh, as was with David uh, – Senator David Vitter and uh, Randall Tab- uh, uh, Harlan Ullman as well. Okay. So, so, and then you couldn't process the rest yourself. You just couldn't do it. We couldn't do it because we just didn't have the skills. So, I then one thing I should mention at this point, Ed, is we did identify that a U.S. attorney in Washington was a customer of the service. Now, this created a kind of interesting um, situation because we could allege, and in fact, I wrote Alberto Gonzalez, who was the attorney general at the time, and said, look, you can't prosecute this if someone from your office was a uh, frequent client of the of the escort service because that's a conflict of interest. I want an independent prosecutor. You have 72 hours or I'm releasing all the phone records into the public domain. This was March of 2007. Uh, The result was the government immediately went into court and got what is now the infamous March 22nd restraining order telling me personally I was not to release those uh, phone records into the public domain. And, of course, uh, besides the 2000 that ABC News had, for a period of time I did not release those records. You know know something? Now that I think about this, why the hell can't you release these records? What is, what is in this restraining order? Because I, I can release my records if I want. I have plenty of records here, uh, my own phone bills and my own electric bill. If I want to release it, I can release it. Why not? What's it's, their reason? It's a good question. And the answer is that the government told the judge, and again, this was a, a hearing that I, we weren't even aware of. It was called an ex parte hearing, that, look, Mr. Sibley is going to call these people up and harass them and scare them into not testifying against Gene at trial. He's going to harass our witnesses, intimidate our witnesses, and therefore he has to be restrained. So as a result, that, that was why the order was issued in March of 2007. That is mind-blowing. Yeah, they were in a panic, and they sort of caught a tiger by the tail, thought Jean would roll over in October of 2006, and when she didn't, I guess they didn't see any way out except to go forward, but they didn't realize what I had and what I would do with it uh, in due course. Now, let me ask you a question, because then this is the, obviously today, this has turned you into like a pit bull, you know, like a, a, a were you always this aggressive and, uh, and um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, it's just the way I litigate. I don't take prisoners, and I don't practice law on my knees. Yeah, because this is a – well, she got the right guy. i tell you that. Man. I won't, okay, so ultimately, though, they got this crazy, unbelievable restraining order, and I'm sure you challenged that many, many times, correct? Well, we did, and what most people don't realize is come June of 2007, the restraining order is technically partially vacated. And I'm now allowed to release the phone numbers, but not the names and addresses of the clients and escorts for Pamela Martin and Associates Escort Service. And so I, by this time, had scanned the entire 10,000 pages of phone records, if you will. And um, I may have misstated the number. I think it was like 3,000 pages of phone numbers. Uh, In any event, we had scanned it all in and put it on a PDF. And I created 50 copies of uh, CDs with the phone records in raw data form and distributed them widely to people of interest, uh, journalists and and gawkers, I suppose, uh, in June and July of 2007. The result was um, a bunch of students up at Brandeis University in Boston made the phone records into a searchable database. So if you put in your uh, cell phone number, Ed, if it was in the records, the date time of the call from that cell phone would then pop up. And we had lots of people putting in their husband's cell phone numbers and coming up with their husband's cell phones. And I got a lot of calls from some very angry husbands and some wives and Lord knows what else. But uh, ultimately, the numbers became public. But here was the problem. There are no white pages for cell phone numbers. That is, 
if you have a cell phone number, I assume you do, I can't look it up uh, and find it easily. Now, you're an investigator. You may have some resources that certainly we didn't have in 2006, but right. there's no simple way to identify the owner of a cell phone number on a particular date and time. And so while the vast majority of numbers that we identified prior to the year 2000 went to uh, hotels and businesses and private homes, they were all landlines, uh, and they were in the white pages or in public records of some sort. After 2000, most people were using cell phones and using their cell phones to call Gene's escort service. So now we had a wall after 2000 of not being able to identify who these individuals were because we couldn't uh, – connect a cell phone number with a particular person. For example, this Harlan Ullman called from his house, so we were very easy able to identify his number um, and that it was him because we could find his number in the public records. Senator David Vitter's cell phone number was public knowledge, and so we, we were able to track back and find his number uh, because we were able to uh, identify the number that way. This searchable database you described before that these students made, is that still available? No. The Brandeis boys took it down at Gene's request um, shortly before the trial in April of 2008. Okay. Now, have you done any work on this? I, I know you have because we saw some stuff you released recently. So let's stick with uh, to the time frame. So now, what? how did this uh, – you went to trial. How did that go? Was it stacked right away? Yeah, obviously. Well, in for a lot of reasons uh, – in October of 2007, I release. Uh, I go to the court, uh, Judge Gladys Kessler, who's in charge of Gene's criminal case, and I said ex parte again, without telling the government I was there, Judge Kessler, I want to issue subpoenas to establish the defense that Gene was acting for the U.S. government, and to do that, I need to subpoena the intelligence agencies, the police departments, and the White House because that's where I knew the loci of the political prosecution came from. And Judge Kessler said, absolutely, you are entitled to that, and I will order those subpoenas to be issued. I will order the U.S. Marshal Service to deliver those subpoenas, and you will get the information to answer your questions so that you can raise a legitimate criminal defense of this trial. Those subpoenas in due course are beginning to be served shortly before Thanksgiving on 2007. And... The, the the community in D.C. goes nuts. They don't realize what to do. I've also subpoenaed at the same time every cell phone company, giving them a list of 6,000 telephone numbers, asking them to tell me who on those tel telephone numbers list are customers of theirs and what those customers' names and addresses are. So up to Thanksgiving 2007, these about 25 different subpoenas are being served all over D.C. Things are going crazy, and... On one morning, um, I think it was the 26th or 27th of November 2007, Judge Kessler is removed from the case, and a new judge named Judge Robertson is brought in on the case. Judge Robertson is a FISA judge, and that is shorthand for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court judge. This is the court that approves the secret wiretapping subpoenas, which Ed Snowden uh, revealed to the world in the CIA's and the NSA's Project PRISM, where they basically collected the phone calls of everyone in the United States for a five- or six-year period. This was a secret judge, and he immediately was put in place of Judge Kessler, who was very sympathetic to us. And then at a rather infamous hearing in December of 2007, immediately quashed all my subpoenas and told the agencies that they didn't have to respond to my subpoenas. And remarkably, in open court, he said to me, and I'm almost quoting verbatim, Mr. Sibley, I've been getting a lot of phone calls about your subpoenas, and I'm quashing all of them. And at this point, the U.S. attorney jumped up and said, does that include Mr. Sibley's subpoena of the White House? I want to be clear. And the judge said, yes, I'm, I'm quashing the subpoena, Mr. Sibley's subpoena of the White House. So all of a sudden, everything that Judge Kessler had agreed to and understood, Judge Robertson came in without even asking me, without giving me a chance to be heard, and undid it all to stop those subpoenas from going forward. What reason did he give for quashing the subpoenas? That's not only an interesting question, it has an interesting answer. That's right, that's I got you on the show, man. <laughs> he, he did not give a reason except to say that he'd been getting a lot of phone calls, which was totally improper. You're not supposed to call a judge privately and ask him to do something. You walk into open court and say, I have a reason, judge, for you to quash my subpoena. And you can even do that in a sealed proceeding, but you don't just call the judge. 
Uh, and more importantly, the order he issued quashing the judge does not appear to this day in the docket or the or the records of the of the of the case against Gene Palfrey. Okay, well, if it's not in the, I was just going to say, well, if it's not in the record, then you can go and, and uh, proceed with the subpoenas. But no, you can't because the case is over. Right. I, well, yeah. that's correct. There's no legal reason to be issuing subpoenas yeah. for this information at this point in time. Is that the first time you've ever seen a, an order disappear from a, from litigation? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, that's the first time. It's, it's just it, it's insane to me. Yeah, it's insane. Okay, I'm gonna take. We gotta take a commercial break. We are here with Montgomery Blair Sibley, who, who's turning into my new hero. <laughs> okay, I'm very impressed with this whole story. I, there's a lot more here that I that I did not know about. Montgomery Blair Sibley. Uh, there's a website called WhyJustHer.com, and that's where you can get a hold of uh, Mr. Sibley's book, Why Just Her, which is about uh, Gene Palfrey. We'll be right back after these messages with more of Montgomery Blair Sibley. Thank you so much. This is your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. And if you're enjoying the show right now, th there's more. You can get more. You can go to the Ed Opperman YouTube channel, and you could subscribe there. And we have archives of all of our past shows for over the past three years, about 200, 300 shows. Uh, you can also go to the Opperman Report Spreaker channel, and you could follow us there. Uh, again, a ton of shows, about 300 shows on there. And whenever we do an impromptu show, uh, an emergency-type broadcast that we do during the week occasionally, you'll get an email notifying you of breaking news and spontaneous broadcast that we may do during the week. You can also go to oppermanreport.com and become a member. If you become a member, you help support the free archives on Spreaker and YouTube, and you help support the free shows on Friday evening and on Saturday evening. Each of these shows, Friday evening and Saturday evening, are carried for free on seven internet stations, okay? Uh, so you help support that, but also, too, at OppermanReport.com in the members section, we have exclusive content. Uh, shows that are recorded during the week that are only available to members. Uh, so please check out OppermanReport.com and help support the show. The son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement, Bernie Sanders. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. Bernie moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq war, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system that holds up a rigged economy. Bernie's campaign is funded by over a million small contributions from people like you. He's fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. Bernie Sanders. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Check out strawmanmusic.com. Sean Duff is our webmaster here at the Opperman Report, and uh, he's a very talented musician. He's part of a band called Strawman. They're based up there in Canada. Don't hold that against them. Uh, these are like-minded folks. If you like the shows you hear on the Opperman Report, you'll like the music that they have over at strawmanmusic.com. Enough is enough. Wall Street's greed and illegal behavior drove this country into the worst economic downturn since the 1930s. And then, after getting a huge taxpayer bailout because they were too big to fail, it turns out that three out of the four largest banks are bigger today than they were before we bailed them out. That's crazy. I'm Bernie Sanders. My plan break up the big banks who are strangling our economy and make them pay their fair share of taxes. Then we can invest in the middle class, expand Social Security, and provide universal college education. I'll rein in Wall Street behavior so they can't crash our economy again. Will they like me? No. Will they begin to play by the rules if I'm president? You better believe it. 
I'm Bernie Sanders, Democratic candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. You know, you can get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator, if you go to my website, emailrevealer.com. Now, this is a limited edition book, okay? And you can get a signed copy of this book, and it'll be personally autographed to you or whoever you want to give the book to as a gift. Once you have my signature on that book, you can copy the signature and put it on checks and pass them all over the world. Emailrevealer.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator. He's fought injustice and inequality his whole life. Bernie Sanders. As a college student, he was arrested for challenging segregated housing. Bernie marched with Dr. King and thousands of others for civil rights. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families on health care and jobs. Now he's taking on Wall Street banks and a corrupt political system that keeps in place a rigged economy. Bernie Sanders, a reformer who believes in ending racial profiling and mass incarceration so the justice system works for everyone. Bernie Sanders. There is no president who will fight harder to end institutional racism and reform our broken criminal justice system. Bernie Sanders, an honest leader building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. We're here with Montgomery Blair Sibley. He's the author of the book, Why Just Her? This is about the D.C. madam, and the website for the book is whyjusther.com. Mr. Sibley, we left off that the Pfizer judge comes in. By the way, what was the reason for them bringing in this new judge? Nobody knows. It was unprecedented to yank one judge off a case she had been involved in for over a year and understood the nuances, and there was a lot of complicated stuff going on, to bring in somebody cold who had no idea. And it's not like Judge Kessler would left the bench or was ill because she has, to this day continues to sit on the D.C. District Court. of uh, uh, District Court. So it was unprecedented just to pull the case from her. Okay, so this FISA judge says, okay, I'm quashing all your subpoenas. I'm not going to tell you why. I'm getting phone calls. Um, so I guess at this point now, what was your defense? Did you have to change your defense? Or what was the plan now? Well, something peculiar happened on that day, and I do have to alert you to. Okay. Verizon, Verizon Wireless had gotten my subpoena a couple of days before the hearing, uh, before Judge Robertson. And in their very efficient way, after a little prodding from me, they sent me a disk. And the CD on it had the answer to my subpoena. And, in fact, it contained 815 account records of individuals whose phone numbers appeared in and among the 6,000 I had sent them by subpoena. Obviously, Sprint, AT&T, all those other wireless carriers, their subpoenas were quashed. But Verizon's got through before Judge Robertson quashed all the other subpoenas. Very interesting. So now you have them, but you still can't use them in court. Well, no, that's an interesting question. Now, yes, we could use them in court, but about this time, for reasons that were never entirely clear, Gene decided to go with a different attorney to represent her in the criminal trial. And that's a long, drawn-out story, but the long and short of it was she felt and was told by people that I was being too aggressive and I would hurt her chances at trial. She needed a more traditional attorney, and as such, she uh, replaced me with another attorney here in D.C. who would ultimately try the criminal case and not call a single witness to the stand, including those uh, that we knew about and now the ones we knew from the Verizon wireless subpoena return. I, can you be sympathetic, though, with her choice of saying, okay, my God, you know, this is way too big for me. This guy is a pit bull. <laughs> this guy is a super pit bull. You know, and people are probably telling her, hey, listen, someone can, can finesse this and kind of negotiate something. Can you be sympathetic with her uh, decision to do that? I'm not sure sympathetic is the word I would use. I mean, obviously, it wasn't a rash decision. In fact, Judge Robertson himself called us privately into his chambers to discuss it. And the end result was 
I believe Gene was manipulated during a fragile time to take a more conservative approach to the one that I was going to be pursuing on her behalf. And all I could do as her attorney was respect her choice because it's not my job to tell a client what to do. I can only give them the options to make sure they're making an informed decision. She was copus mentis at the time, and as a result, uh, Preston Burton became her attorney for the criminal proceedings in uh, April of okay. 2008. Well, obviously, you're more familiar with the facts than I am. So, Now, now ultimately, she was convicted. What, what did she get? Uh, in April 14th, I think, of 2008, the jury came back after a very short uh, period out and found her guilty of all charges. Judge Robertson adjourned the case for six weeks, which is the normal course in these kind of cases, in order for a pre-sentence report to be prepared, which is required, and set sentencing for, I believe, uh, early June of 2008, and Jean was released on bail uh, during that period of time. And that's when the, her, she was found hung in a shed. Yes. Just to be a little bit more clear on the timeline, uh, we had a very aggressive appeal plan. I was brought back in by Gene to actually do the appeal, and we were very optimistic that we had planted so many error judgments in the case that we would have a very strong case on appeal to get the whole thing overturned. Uh, there were prosecutorial misconduct allegations regarding the discovery, regarding contact with witnesses, behaviors, the whole nine yards. And Jean was very upbeat about all that. Uh, ultimately, she went to her condominium that she had, the government never knew about in Orlando. And then um, a couple of days after that, went to see her mother who lived in a trailer park in, um, in Florida. And on, as I said, May 1st, 2008, her mother found her in the morning uh, hanging from a rope in her tool shed uh, in the back of her trailer park lot. And what is your opinion on, on that? What do you think? you think it, this could have been a suicide or you think it definitely uh, was a murder? Ed, that's a question I've asked myself and I've been asked many times. And I don't have a 100% answer that I can live with. There are too many things that make it look very unusual for Jean to have done this. And there are elements of this uh, death that make it very likely it was a suicide. So uh, regrettably, it's one of those questions in life that you're never going to get an answer to. I don't know. Okay. Now, you, this, you have to, now they, they started coming after you too now, right? Well, now the case was over. There was some winding up of the of the civil forfeiture case. I was still her attorney on the civil forfeiture case, and she expected and wanted me to go forward. The government convicted her. They didn't convict her assets, and now we have to have a separate civil proceeding in front of another jury to actually try the allegations against her assets, if you will. Uh, then a lot of things happened very quickly. Jean has died. Her mother is then supplanted as the uh, representative of her estate. Uh, my law license is now automatically, or I should say not automatically, my law license is suspended by the state of Florida for allegations that occurred eight years earlier. And immediately the district court in uh, District of Columbia suspends my license of practice, taking me out of the civil forfeiture case. Because in the civil forfeiture case, I have a lot more discovery options than I do in a criminal case where I have to ask permission for discovery. In a civil case, you get whatever you want, basically. So... Um, all that happens very quickly, and the case is wound up. Jean's mother gets a check for about $300,000, if I remember, and the government keeps the balance of the estate, and the whole thing is, is put to rest. Okay. So, and then, that, then what year was that? That was in the summer of 2008. 2008. Now, from 2008 until today, have, have you uh, done anything else with this? Uh, I was suspended from the practice of law right. and actually I kind of welcomed it as a vacation and took the next year to write the book which we've talked about briefly because uh, I wanted to memorialize everything that went on because I knew as I get older I'd forget it was so much and it is quite a sick book it's more of an encyclopedia than, than, a, than a book I suspect but um, then I put it to bed life moved on for me I had the son I was raising and other things going on in my life and I didn't really think about this case anymore after the book was done until January of 2016, uh, when I was preparing to teach a privacy course at a college up here in Vir Northern Virginia, and decided it would be interesting for the students to see not only 
the, the privacy statutes uh, that were involved in this and other cases I had, but how the actual mechanisms of protecting those privacy rights move forward. And that's when I opened the box that I'd been hauling around of this case for the last uh, seven or eight years and started going through those records. And that's what triggered sort of my aha moment when the light bulb went off over my head. So you were going through these phone records by hand and you spotted something that involves the, the, the presidential election of 2016? No, I, I actually, the Verizon records are, are in a database on an Excel spreadsheet. And I had opened up that spreadsheet just that I had forgotten what was going on during all that period of time and started looking at the names, the numbers, and the agencies in, that were ultimately identified by Verizon Wireless as customers or escorts of the service. And that's when I realized that with the looming presidential and in, you know the Senate and the House is up for re-election in November as well, uh, the information I had is something I thought many people would deem relevant to their decision-making process. And as a result, I felt not only the right, but indeed the obligation under the First Amendment to, to um, expose this information for the public's uh, consideration. Uh, so let me be clear. Uh, you, you're not specifically saying that the information that disturbed you was presidential election. It also could have been the House or the Senate. It was all three. All three. It, it involves issues in the operation of our government that I believe need to be addressed not only by representatives and senators, but by the presidential candidates themselves. So you went back to the court and uh, you, uh, to explain what you went back to the court and asked that these uh, the, the, uh, the, the restraining order be lifted, correct? And, yeah, I did. And here was the confusion for me. Okay. I knew there was some sort of restraining order because it was ambiguous as to what was permitted and un not permitted, I understood there were orders that never showed up in the court records, and I didn't want to find myself at the end of a, a knock on the door from the U.S. Marshal Service with a, a, a warrant for my arrest for contempt, criminal contempt of court. So as a prudent individual, I went to the court, uh, in this case now another judge named Judge Roberts, and uh, I said to Judge Roberts, I have this information. I think it's relevant. I have a First Amendment right to speak, yet I recognize the court has the authority to limit my speech in certain situations. Please tell me what I can and cannot do. He, Judge Richard Roberts, refused and ordered the clerk to file my pleading. He wasn't going to even let me file the, the request and instead issued an order saying you shouldn't even have these records. I presume you shouldn't have these records. But in all events, I'm not even going to file your request and therefore forget about it. So I politely went back and filed a second pleading saying, Judge, you're wrong. I do have the right to these records. But more importantly, I have the right to have my request at least filed and ruled upon so I can take it up on appeal if you disagree with me. He again made a motion, uh, excuse me, issued an order directing the clerk not to file my pleading. And that's when uh, the cow backed into the fan, and we have disaster, of course. Well, how is that? Because ultimately, there is an exhibit that has these phone numbers on them. Uh, Correct. How did that come about? You're a brilliant lawyer. I got to well, tell you, I wish I, I wish I had. <laughs> no, no, no. No, there's an Excel spreadsheet I got from Verizon. Right. I, you know, I have it. Right. Uh, I didn't file that. I just said, Judge, this is what I have. I have a right to, to speak, and I'd like the clarification on how that right has been, if at all, um, limited by the court's order. And he wouldn't answer the question because he closed the courthouse doors to me, to put it in simple terms. So I then went to his uh, boss, the uh, Circuit Court of Appeal, and said, you have to order the clerk to file my pleading so that the judge can rule on it. They ultimately refused to do that. And in the interim, I made a special application to the Supreme Court asking them to intervene as a matter of discretion. And they said, no, we're not going to intervene. Just to give you the procedural battleground, so the, ultimately about a week, uh, excuse me, about a month ago, the appellate court said we're not going to order anything, and I've gone back to them one last time and said you can't do that. I expect them to say yes, we can, and then I'll be procedurally postured to go back to the Supreme Court, and this time they're going to have a lot harder time ignoring me because I'll be filing a uh, pleading that they really have to address. So you're, you're, you're going to continue filing? Right. There's, there's still a procedural vehicle that I have to exhaust, Ed, 
because before I release these records publicly, I want to establish the defense that if I'm charged with releasing them by violating a court order, I exhausted every possible mechanism for seeking relief of that order. And if I do that and they won't even let me file the pleading, I don't think they can enforce an order. I don't think any jury in the country is going to convict me of contempt of court for an order that I wasn't allowed to seek clarification on. And do you suspect that um, if you were to release these documents, that they are going to go back to a 2007 restraining order and and charge you on that? That would be unusual, well, don't you think? Like to, if you'd like to take my place in jail, I'd be happy to roll <laughs> no, no, that. No, I'm not saying But, uh, but um, my question is, though. Jail. Yeah, no, my question. I'll I've take been... <laughs> I'll take the top bunk, okay? Well, my question is, that would be unusual, though, for, for a normal client to, to be concerned about a 2007 restraining order, right? No? Uh, an order of the court, Ed, is yeah. an order of the court. You trespass upon it at your peril. Okay. Whether it's a 10 years old, 20 years old, or 30 years old, it's an order. And, you know, I'm an officer of the court. I respect and honor the rule of law, and I'm approaching it the way it should be approached to say, hey, the order needs to be clarified or changed or vacated or not. There may be compelling national security interest reasons for continuing to muzzle me because I have something that should not be made public for whatever good reason there is. But I get I have a right as a U.S. citizen to go into court to ask the question. And right now, the district court, the appellate court, the Supreme Court are closing their doors, prohibiting me from even walking in and laying the pleading before the court. Now, there is an exhibit, though, in your pleadings uh, that has a list of businesses that were contacting your client, former client, Ms. Palfrey. Now, I, w one of them was the Archdiocese of, of uh, D.C., am I correct? The Archdiocese called the uh, – yes, called Jean on more than one occasion. Do we have any idea why? Well, there's only two reasons you would have dialed Jean's number. But one is because you misdialed it by mistake, in which the call should be a very short duration, 30 seconds. I'm sorry I got the wrong number. The other reason is you were um, trying to organize a date with one of her escorts, and then we see a pattern in the phone records where there's a phone call. It usually lasted three to five minutes. It would end. Jean would then make a call to one of her escorts, so that's the next call from her phone number is going out to one of the escorts. Then there's a second call from Jean back to, and let's say this case, the archdiocese, the same number, saying we've confirmed so-and-so to appear at such-and-such such address at such-and-such such a time. And then about an hour or three hours later, we get a call from that same escort, and that's when they – Jean always insisted they called when they arrived, and they called when they left because she wanted to be keep her escort safe. And so then there'll be two calls about an hour apart from the escort. And um, that pattern belies someone claimed that they dialed the wrong number because um, they wouldn't dial the wrong number twice, you know, within minutes of each other, uh, the way it shows up on the records. Now, in this exhibit that you created, uh, does that pattern exist? If I were to look at this uh, exhibit right now, would I be able to see that pattern of, of the, uh, the archdiocese calling and then her calling the escort then? Or has that been like uh, filtered? You would see that pattern, but not in the exhibit. Ed, just to be okay. clear, you'd have to go back to the phone records and pull up the day of the of that call to see the pattern of call, return call, escort call, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I understand. Now, um, there's some other like there's some major um, defense contractors and law firms, and uh, there's quite an interesting list on there. Uh, well, there are 187 different agencies, companies, private enterprises uh, listed because as I closely read the order, I was not prohibited from listing the names of the companies, just the actual individuals. So that's why I took the rather bold step of listing the companies to let the court know that there was significant issues here that I should have the right to be heard and, and decided. Now, I haven't looked at that uh, exhibit lately, but is there anything on there that you, you think you would want to draw our attention to that says, hey, uh, take a look at this? I think the totality of the list. Yeah. It is really stunning for what it says about what goes on within the beltway here and how there seems to be two sets of laws in this country, one for most of us schmucks out there, yeah. and then the other privileged few who have a set of laws that says you can do whatever you damn please, and there are no legal consequences for your behavior. Yeah, or, or on the other hand, a guy like you who says, hey, I, I'm standing up for my rights, you know, and a, then a big boulder comes crashing down on you. 
Now, uh, well, and that's the that's yeah. the one they don't want to let me in open court because remember, once I walk into open court and there's a judge sitting there and the stenographer is taking down everything we say, and I think uh, you know modestly there'll be a phalanx of journalists and reporters coming to court with me. Uh, I get to say things that now no one can hide from because the judge has to sit there, hear them, and he's going to have to address them. He cannot hide. And uh, like our legislatures hide from big questions all the time, once you're in front of a judge in open court, he's got a problem. Because when you ask him a question about something he did, he can't go running off the bench or he just answered your question. Gotcha. Now, uh, is there uh, another court date coming up? Uh, there is no court date scheduled. I have another lawsuit pending against the judge and the clerk for refusing to file my pleadings, but the judge in that case has refused to even address my emergency motion, which has been pending for over a month. And so I'm just waiting in the in the fullness of time, the Circuit Court of Appeal will rule, and I should be at the Supreme Court with what's called a petition for writ of certiorari by the first week in June. And uh, then that will trigger some interesting behavior across the court spectrum, I believe. Okay. Now, um, in this story, in this interview, is there anything I, I've forgotten to ask you that you think I, that's important to get out? Well, I just wish people could, could hear me okay. say a, a simple statement, which is, if you want to sleep as a citizen, you deserve whatever you get. But every four years, we have a chance to force our public officials to address and answer questions of pressing concerns. And I think this is the time to do this. We shouldn't be talking about how big people's hands are. We should be talking about significant issues that affect the direction this country is taking. And I think we're in a critical time uh, in this country's lifeblood. I agree with you on that 100 percent. Montgomery. Yeah, I know you do, yeah, right? Thank you. Montgomery Blair Sibley. Now, listen, I. Uh, you got to promise me, anything comes up, 24 hours a day, give me a call. Okay, I'll put you right on the air, okay? Don't worry, wake well, me up. I, I, yeah. I've done very few interviews because most of the journalists I run across, Ed, simply want a soundbite, something titillating. And this isn't about titillation. This is about illumination. And that's why you giving me the time to explain this in the detail, which I think people need to understand, uh, is something I, I highly value. And, again, I thank you for that opportunity. No, thank you, too. And also, too, we have a section on the, uh, the website. Well, I'm going to upload these, these last two uh, motions that you, you, you filed, okay? I'm going to upload those on there. So anything you want to send me that you think is important that you want up on there, just send it to me, please. I will do so, Ed. Montgomery Blair Sibley, thank you so much. Author of the book, uh, Why Just Her, and you can get that at whyjusther.com. Sir, thank you so much, okay? Keep in touch. Oh, we will. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by emailrevealer.com. Go to emailrevealer.com. Uh, you can catch your boyfriend or your, your wife, your girlfriend cheating online. Send us their email address. We'll trace it back to online dating websites. Um, if this is the first time you listen to the show, check out uh, oppermanreport.com. You can go to oppermanreport.com. We have a special member section where there's additional content you won't find free either on Friday night or Saturday night. Uh, there's exclusive content on there, uh, and also documents, too. We have a lot of documentation about uh, all the court docs and the Trump lawsuit. Uh, we just put up there, we just put up a whole bunch of documents with um, our guest, uh, Montgomery Blair Sibley, and his uh, litigation involving the D.C. madam. And we have his exhibit with the Verizon telephone numbers. So a lot of good stuff. Today we got a really special show. Because uh, we have Charles Ortel, who's the making a lot of a, a stir in the past week or two, and we're lucky to get him. He's a Harvard MBA, and he's been studying the Clinton Foundation. I don't want to put words into his mouth, but we have been, just been talking off the air, so I probably can put a little bit of words into his mouth. And basically, we're, we're discussing about how this Clinton Foundation is, is charity fraud. Uh, Mr. Ortel, are you there? 
I am indeed. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're getting a lot of contacts from people trying to get you on the air. Now, tell us about yourself. Who is Charles Ortel? Thanks for asking. Um, I am somebody, I'm the oldest of three boys, uh, the product of the Ph.D. in nuclear physics and expert on Johann Sebastian Bach. So as a young boy, uh, I had no excuse for not doing well in school. I went to good schools. I went straight from Yale College to Harvard Business School and got into banking in 1980. Uh, just as that world was taking off. And I got lucky, did a lot of complex uh, deals around the world, big deals, and ran a very large business at a young age. Um, ultimately, in 2002, uh, I had to retire briefly. I had to gain custody of my two kids. Took five years off, best five years of my life with my kids, and then saw the credit crisis coming and specifically saw that General Electric was not as sound as people thought it was, and I exposed them. And um, that got me into politics and commentating on geopolitics. And I decided to start this business, which I'll do next year, helping people who have money and want to build it, people who believe the United States of America, in fact, is an exceptional country because they understand our history, whether you're on the right or the left, and people who want to find a good place to put to give money away. In our country, people are very generous. And, in fact, it's the bottom 80% of this country that gives the most to charity uh, relative to their income. They don't much to have much wealth, so of course relative to what little wealth they have. And it's a lot of money. And people who give money to charities expect the charities to be well run. We have a million charities in this country, literally, slightly more than a million. And so the, the, when I saw the Clinton Foundation, now I don't like the Clintons. I, don't, I know a lot about their history and I just don't like what they've done. But I decided that I would uh, look at their foundation because people had a hard time understanding it. And last year, in Mar by March of 2015, I had concluded it was a fraud. But I saw that Hillary was I expected her fully to run. I knew that she would she would be the presumptive front runner. I knew it would take a while for people to under to get into this. So I knew I had a while to study their extensive operations, which I've been doing now for 15 months. And the interesting thing about a charity, a public charity, that raises money, it's going to be raising money while we're online, while we're talking right now, they're raising money. The rules are really strict. You have to have, you know, if you operate as they do in all 50 states, you have to register in most U.S. states. You operate internationally. You've got to register internationally. You've got to file federal tax forms. All of those forms have to be available to the public. They have to be accurate, and they're not. And I, uh, and I could see the flaws that other people wouldn't necessarily spot. So I've been explaining this on my website, www.charlesortel.com. And I'm trying to force them, raise the pressure on government authorities to discipline this charity fraud network, which is not $2 billion of declared revenues. I think it's more like $100 billion, and I think it touches as many as 100 countries in the world. When you said it's not, did you mean that it's not accurate or it's not available to the public? Well, no. It, it, what I'm saying, the, the information that has been supplied by the Clinton Foundation, the way it works is if your foundation is above a certain size, and it's actually a very small threshold, I think it's about half a million dollars, okay. you have to submit your tax filings, your state and federal and foreign tax filings, but for the U.S., they have to be audited. That means you have to get an accounting firm to, to verify the numbers. And the Clinton Foundation has never procured a legally compliant audit, audit for any year since 1997. So all of these forms are false and materially misleading, and any expert in accounting, anybody modestly familiar with accounting, will be able to look at what's on, on the file. First, you will see no audits on their website for the years 97 through 2003. They're not on their website. Then, or, or four, rather. And the ones afterwards are all false and materially misleading. Well, that's pretty extreme. Um, and no official agency is looking into this to, to examine what's going on? Well, here's the deal. So the, the way it works is that, that when an investigation happens, the procedures vary, whether it's state, federal, or international, but the standard theme is that... that the governments don't want to say, you know, we've launched an investigation. Okay. Um, so it's very tough to gain confirmation. But as far as the, so I wrote an article, which I would encourage, not just because I wrote it, but 
but because I think it, it does lay the case out. March 16th, I think it was, around March 16th, 2015 in Breitbart, with so many red flags, why isn't the IRS auditing the Clinton Foundation? And it lays out the concerns that I spotted then. And uh, so far, no government authority has come forward and said, you know, we are in fact going to audit. Now, we know uh, the situation in the IRS in the U.S. is incredibly contentious. We know that people on the right believe that right-leaning conservative Tea Party groups were aggressively targeted by the same department that should have been going after the Clinton Foundation. It gave the Clinton Foundation and its affiliates a pass, but it aggressively enforced the regulations against applicants and charities that were deemed to be right-leaning. So there's a you know, miscarriage of justice. There. I, I'm somebody who believes that everyone, you know, you, you can have a differing point of view, whether it's right, left, neutral, whatever, but the scales of justice should be applied evenly and blindly. And, you know, this is a horrific case where, in my view, where the Clintons were given a pass, right-leaning groups were targeted, the IRS is under the threat uh, of, of the head of it being impeached now. So we have this horrible problem inside the U.S. where at a federal level there's contention. And typically what happens is the foreign governments, they'll say, well, it's a U.S. charity. You know, if there were a problem, the federal government would go after it. So the, US, the foreign people uh, may or may not decide to do anything about it. So I've been reaching out. And I'll tell you, you mentioned off air that there are connections in South Africa and Ireland um, and Haiti, that in every country in the world where the Clinton Foundation operates, it has been operating illegally since the beginning. Now, now that's, that's amazing. Now, because when you mentioned 1997, I didn't even know it, know it was in existence that long. But now, okay, now you say, okay, fine, the Obama administration, they're using the IRS, politically motivated, you know, just like Nixon did, right? But now, well, we don't want it going on on either side, because sooner or later it's going <laughs> to take down one of us, right? But... Uh, what about the Bushes? What, are you, why, what is your opinion of why the Bushes never investigated? That's a good question. Now, um, uh, and I, I, here I will say that, you know, I am distantly related to them. Um, I know them. I mean, I know some of them. And I have studied this very carefully. And I asked, I wondered the same question. Why would, you know, you, you, when Bill Clinton was president, they set the foundation up. They started October 23rd, 1997. Uh, they operated it through that period where he was, you know, they tried to impeach him and he was acquitted and, and all that stuff. Uh, but then George W. won, and he won for eight years. You know, you would have thought that perhaps uh, something might have been done about this because they started operating illegally in January of 2001, if not sooner. You know, why didn't George W. Bush go after this? And why didn't Republicans go after them? Why did George H.W. Bush work with Bill Clinton in 2005 forward on the tsunami? Right. Why did W. work with him in Haiti? And I think you have to go back into the past. I mean, uh, there, there was a very contentious uh, episode, I don't know how much you know about it, involving Harkin Energy. And I think when you go back into the past and you understand the ties that the Bushes have in Arkansas, and there's some suspicious transactions back then. It's easy to imagine that you know the Clintons would have sent word to the Bushes. You're not going to. You, you're just not going to investigate this foundation. You're not oh. going to do it. Okay. The, the corruption was too deep. Yeah. Okay. But but let me explain if I can why I say that right from the start there was a problem. Your viewers and, and listeners and even I when I started on this did not under may not understand how strict the rules are on charities, particularly on charities that operate internationally. The U.S., the IRS, is suspicious of Americans who say, you know, we're going to operate an international charity because it's expensive to travel internationally, and there are many examples of people who get together and say, you know, instead of writing an after-tax check to go travel around Europe, why don't we set up a foundation to study something in Europe, and then we'll deduct our, our travel costs, and nobody really checks this anyway, so we'll just try you know, rip off the government and, and have some fun. So the rules have evolved over time. And a, a, a charity that operates internationally must make plain in its application that it's going to do that. And it must specifically have controls in place. It's got to exercise tight controls over its international activities. You can't delegate authority to a bunch of people abroad. And it really has to be 
for a, a specific tax exempt purpose. You can't say that uh, you're going to improve your golf game as a charity. I mean, that, that's just not doesn't pass muster. And when you go into the regulations, a lot of work has been done, not over decades, but over centuries on the definition of what is charity, what isn't charity. And so when this thing was set up back in 97, what it was meant to be was purely and simply a research facility and archive based in Little Rock, Arkansas. That was its charitable purpose. That was the purpose for which it was approved that federally, and that was the purpose for which it was approved in each state. But when Bill uh, left office, you know, there was huge controversy over his pardon of Mark Rich and other things. And he got in bed with a guy who was now uh, just out of prison called Rajat Gupta, who, uh, and they, as it, together, they, they said what they were going to do after an earthquake in India was to help the victims of that earthquake. And they organized a companion charity called the American India Foundation, which is a complete fraud. The application was incorrect, materially misleading. They've never had a valid audit. Their books and records are all screwed up. He, Bill has been the honorary chairman of that thing since 19, 2001. Rajat Gupta has now spent time in prison. The collection of fraudsters and criminals and accused people who would never normally be allowed to operate a charity that is associated with the American India Foundation is astounding. What was he in prison for, Gupta? Sorry? What did uh, Gupta go to prison for? He went to prison. He, Rajat Gupta was a, a, he was a celebrity. He was an international celebrity because he was the first... Indian head of a worldwide consulting giant called McKinsey, and he walked on water for a long period. And then he took McKinsey, which was a very conservative operation, into the dot-com mess in 1998, 9, 2000. That blew up, and he was sort of on the outs. Clinton was on the outs. They teamed up together, and there's going to be a lot of information coming out on my site and elsewhere on Rajat Gupta's criminal activities with Bill Clinton starting in 2002. In addition, uh, but what he got in trouble for, he ultimately was on the board, Rajat was, of uh, Procter & Gamble and Goldman Sachs, and he got sent away for um, insider trading ah. in relation uh, yeah, in 2008. So, but that full story hasn't been told, and we I don't necessarily know the entire story, but there's a big story involving Rajat Gupta, McKinsey, outsourcing, um, and criminal behavior involving Bill Clinton and his family. Uh, around Rajat Gupta. So that international activity, when you, you, you're not allowed to do, as a, when you operate a charity, you're not allowed to engage in any criminal activity. It's a not-for-profit operation. You're, you stand in the shoes of government. It is disqualifying to be involved in illegal activity. So even a misdemeanor so, conviction would disqualify you? A what? A misdemeanor conviction. No, no, no. I'm saying that the charity itself cannot do engage in illegal activity. So sure. you can't uh, – charity fraud is different than corporate fraud. Corporate fraud, you have to – you produce, you have, generally you have to prove that the person committing the fraud in knowingly and intentionally deceived uh, somebody to, and derived a, an, an unwarranted financial gain. It's a very tough standard in corporate, uh, the corporate side. Not so and not for profit. Not for, not for profit, you're not supposed to engage in any for profit activities. All you have to show for charity solicitation fraud is that the charity ha produced books and records that were false and materially misleading and uncorrected in the public domain as it simultaneously solicited using mail, telephone, or digital media for contributions, which is easily proven now, in this case. Um, can you be the director of a charity or on the board? Uh, if you have a felony conviction or a misdemeanor conviction, now I guess I, I don't know about the misdemeanor, but I in no way if with a felony. No way. So now does Gupta has a felony or, or a misdemeanor? I think he now has a felony. Okay, now, he's off the charity board. Right. He's off at this point. But but the point is that one of the things that Rajat Gupta did, you know, in this world where you have ten jobs and you're just doing this, and doing that, and on this board and flying around the world first class or in private jets. You know, there's people like, lots of people like that. He was yeah. one of those people. He was a celebrity, know-it-all, everywhere guy. And he has only been caught so far for his involvement with his crook who's away for a lot longer, Raj Rajratnam of Galleon fame. He's been sent away, I think, for 15 years. I think Rajat Gupta was only for two or so. Um, but that was before... 
uh, people started looking more carefully into his record, as I have been doing. And one of the conditions, generally, of when you go to prison is that you have to cooperate with authorities. So now, once authorities start looking at this more closely, they're going to discover that Rajat Gupta corrupted the Gates Foundation and corrupted something called the Global Fund and corrupted many things. So we're going to have to take a close look, at a, a, a new look, at everything that Bill and Rajat Gupta and, and others were involved with internationally. And I bring this up to say, if you start out as a presidential archive focused on Little Rock, and get approved for that. You can't change your purpose. You have to go to the IRS if you want to change your purpose. And you have to say, look, you know, I, I decided, you know, I was going to be a presidential archive, and now I want to do something else. And the logical thing the IRS will say is, well, did you accomplish your first purpose? So one thing that will get your uh, listeners going here is that starting in 2002, Bill Clinton, and then aggressively in 2003. Bill Clinton, in the, in the name Clinton Foundation, illegally began soliciting funds to fight HIV-AIDS internationally. And he convinced the government of Ireland in 2003 to make a massive pledge over 100, around $100 million or more dollars to this purpose when there was, it was not authorized to fight HIV-AIDS. And he raised this money. And who knows where the money really went. It was supposed to go into Mozambique and afterwards into South Africa. And now Mozambique, you know, one of the standard things the Clintons have done here is they have, have, have basically coaxed donor money out, uh, focusing on the hardship suffered. And, you know, Mozambique is, I've never been there, been all over Africa, but not to Mozambique. And, you know, that's a country that was racked with civil war, landmines everywhere, all sorts of problems, horrific shape. And, and he convinces the government of Ireland and other people to send money to fight HIV AIDS, but the problem is there's, you know, there's no infrastructure in Mozambique. Who knows where that money really went? In South Africa, there was a little bit more infrastructure, and South Africa actually being a, a country that has a lot of uh, UK heritage and law in it, you have to register in South Africa. All of the registrations for the Clinton Foundation, if there are any in South Africa, are false and materially misleading. They have not disclosed the defects that operated in the, uh, that, that, that taint this thing globally in Arkansas and New York and every U.S. state and federally. So the, fir the first problem is that they engaged in illegal fundraising. The next problem is that this, this Rajat Gupta um, helped the Clintons connect up with a crooked uh, supplier of generic HIV-AIDS medicines called Ranboxy, R-A-N-B-A-X-Y. Now, if you Google Ranboxy and you Google the following story, Dirty Medicine, it's a Fortune magazine story. You will see that Ramboxy had to pay a gigantic settlement for basically allowing adulterated AIDS medicines and other medicines to circulate into the food chain, into the drug chain around the world. The one piece of value added that the Clinton Foundation was supposed to have was to procure these drugs, to make sure that they were, you know, have the oversight to make sure that you didn't do this kind of stuff. Well, starting in 2002, three. There's abundant evidence that Ramboxy provided drugs to uh, countries under the supervision of the Clinton Foundation. And, of course, that's illegal, uh, and that was not disclosed. Um, certainly the, the dots, the financials for this operation just don't appear in the Clinton Foundation books, none of it. And you can look at the, the things that I've been doing over the last 15 months. Um, the Clintons must have felt that nobody would ever check this, but um, there are each country that Ireland, the other donor countries, and some of the recipient countries have to write after-action reports, which are on the public domain. So you can go back and see what they say what happened and compare that to what the disclosures in the Clinton Foundation, and they don't match. Well, I was going to ask you that. Now, if I have a, a charity here in the United States and I say I'm going to send AIDS drugs to South Africa, now, do, don't I have to show an accounting of where that money went once it got to South Africa? Absolutely. And, and, you know, what you have to do, the way it works is the IRS, you know, has difficulty staying on top of the roughly $1 million, $1 million charity, right. U.S. charities. So there's strict rules. You're supposed to, you, you operate in a foreign country, you're supposed to produce reports that say, you know, we collected so much in the way of euros and so much in the way of pounds and so much in the way of Canadian dollars and we exchange those at these rates and then we 
got this big pile of revenue and here's how you can figure that out. And then we held everything in dollars and then we turned around and spent so much South African Rand and so much Mozambique and whatever they are. And this is what we, here's where the money went and here's the kind of drugs we bought from these vendors and cost. You can't do any of that. And, and you know, there's a lot of, especially in the period uh, 2001 forward, currencies have moved all over the place. They fluctuate widely, and this is, uh, you know, anybody with any business experience would look at this and say, all right, there are no independent trustees. All the trustees in this period are Clinton lackeys. But, uh, Terry McAuliffe was a central figure in this from 2000 all the way to 2013. He is the man who conceived of, you know, selling the White House, basically, to campaign contrib- contributors. He's the key director. There, Bill Clinton himself was not a director of the parent charity until 2013. Nonetheless, he directed the affairs of the charity. And, of course, the rules are for charity that there's strict rules about blood relatives and, and marriage relatives, what the business transactions, if you engage in any business transactions, there's no materiality standard. Any business transactions have to be disclosed, and they weren't disclosed. Um, so th- this is a textbook case, the Clinton Foundation, of how not to run a charity. So the polar opposite of what you're supposed to do. You, you know, as you describe this, this is terrifying that they're getting away with this. Now, are you getting, have they contacted you, a cease and desist letter, or threatened a lawsuit, anything like that, saying, hey, Mr. Ortel, you don't know what you're talking about, we can prove otherwise? No, and, you know, this, the way I operated before when I exposed GE, uh, you know, in America we have a First Amendment right to say anything. Right. And um, this uh, public charities are different than, than pro- for-profit corporations. But in GE what I did and what I have done with the Clinton Foundation is I'm only evaluating their public disclosures. Right? The, anything that I've found is any member of the public can see, and I put my information up, and I am entirely entitled to do this, and I am a whistleblower. I am blowing the whistle on the largest criminal fraud conspiracy uh, ever. It's bigger than Madoff. Madoff was only like sixty billion. This is a hundred billion or more. Now, have you made filed any complaints to any uh, government agencies to look into this? Well, uh, the, I have contacted certain governments, uh, and I'm going to step the pressure up next week. Uh, I'm actually traveling to Washington D.C. to meet with people, and uh, and I am going to steadily increase the pressure until governments do what they're supposed to do. I now have contacts around the world. I'll tell, break some news with you. Um, the government of Norway has I've been in touch with their aid department. I have a complete list of what the government of Norway says they sent to the Clinton Foundation, and it does not match the Clinton Foundation disclosures. And a number of the grants went to entities that I will be informing the, the, uh, the Norwegians never legally existed. Take, for example, I know you'll have some viewers who will be passionate about climate change. Uh, let's not debate that. But I'll just tell you that the climate operation that's part of the Clinton Foundation is a complete and utter fraud. It is not a charity. What it is is instead a clearinghouse, a business development operation for corrupt companies like Siemens and others um, to sell equipment into cities around the world that they would be buying anyway because, you know, this old equipment, you know, gets old, you've got to be replaced. It is not a charity, a t- climate operation. Another one that is not a char- charity but is a, comp- it's a, it's a gathering for fraudsters and corrupt politicians, the Clinton Global Initiative, complete fraud. But you're saying in Norway that they gave grant money to organizations that do not exist. They gave grant money to uh, Clinton Foundation entities that were not legally in existence, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a specific case. So okay. the, the Clinton, the Clinton uh, HIV effort, all right, it was illegally, it illegally began around January of 2001. In Bill's book, he talks about it, it started July 2002. That's not true. An organization was uh, formed in January, on January 29th, 2001, called the International AIDS Trust. And about a million dollars was raised for it in 2001. There was an application filed at what's called a 1023, was filed, which was false and material, materially misleading. An annual report on Form 990 was filed, and that was also basically inaccurate. 
And there is no record that that entity was ever formally approved. That is what's called a determination letter. But there is a record that the, the charity was dissolved by 2005. Yet that thing still exists. It's still the illegally taking money. It's housed inside Emory University, the Rollins School of Public Health. You're not allowed to do this. And then Bill went over, and starting in 2002, after the AIDS conference in uh, uh, Barcelona, he, he went around various places in the Caribbean and in Africa and South Africa, um, and started raising money without disclosing the defects of the International AIDS Trust, without disclosing the defects of the, uh, his association with the American India Foundation. Then by 2013, there's a press release in July of 2003, rather, um, that where the uh, Prime Minister, I think it was, of Ireland, I think it might have been Mr. Ahern, announces a gigantic grant to the Clinton Foundation, which was not authorized in that year to do where the mo whatever it was that the money was set in that direction. And then in 2004, they decide to file, create this thing called Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiative, Inc., which is an Arkansas corporation. They file a uh, t an application, 1023, there's no record of that anywhere. There is, however, a 990, an annual report for 2004, which shows that a man called Fred Eichner, E-Y-C-H-A-N-E-R, who's a very wealthy and powerful Chicago-based man, passionate about fighting HIV AIDS and other causes, generally Mr. Eichner and in his Alpha Wood Foundation are very well organized. But unfortunately for him, he and George Soros, actually, in 2004 made relatively small illegal contributions to fight HIV AIDS to this vehicle. And then in 2005, this vehicle operated and the Gates Foundation made illegal contributions to fund this entity. Then they, there's no annual report. This is, you can't do this. There's no an annual report filed for the entity in 2005. So by 2007, this, this entity's headquarters were, were shifted to Massachusetts. In 2007, um, as of December 31, 2007, the license to operate this entity was involuntarily revoked by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on March 31st, 2008, in the heat of the presidential campaign. So the government of Norway and various other foundations all made contributions. And actually, the largest donor is this Swiss organization called Unitaid that over time has given $600 million to the Clinton Foundation out of the total $2, two billion declared. Um, all of it for the purposes of fighting HIV AIDS, most of it to this illegally constituted operation in Massachusetts. Now, now why did they, the Massachusetts place, why did they lose their, uh, their uh, right to? Well, the way it works is you, 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 you form a chair, a non-for-profit corporation someplace, mm -hmm. then you file an application with the IRS to be federally tax exempt. Then if you want to raise money in a given U.S. state, you have to file for 46 out of the 50 states, I think. You have to register before you solicit inside the state. And the state will say, yes, you're validly constituted. No, you're not. Um, in this case, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts said, you can't, you can't do business in Massachusetts. We've looked at your application. You don't comply. Oh we revoke your, your authority to operate. You have become, and, the, and the way our system is supposed to work, if your license is revoked in one state, then you're automatically disqualified in all states. So on March 31st, 2008, the trustees of the Clinton Foundation should have understood that the foundation was illegally, it was dead yeah. legally. And yet, in that year, uh, the Clinton Foundation received a lot more money from its biggest donor, Unitaid, than it declared as having received. So, I mean, this is, a, and that's a Democrat-controlled state, and of course, you know, the Clintons are powerful Democrats in the middle of a, a presidential campaign where she's running. Okay, we better take a commercial break. We are with Charles Ortel. His website is charlesortel.com. Uh, th this man, uh, you can just tell, this guy, this is off the top of his head. <laughs> okay, this is an expert on, on charities, charity legalities, charity fraud. There's no doubt in my mind this guy knows what he's talking about. And he's very familiar with every detail of the Clinton Foundation. This is, I'm very impressed. Uh, we're going to be right back with more of Charles, Charles Ortel. Uh, remember, charlesortel.com right after these messages. Thank you so much. This is your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. 
And if you're enjoying the show right now, there, there's more. You can get more. You can go to the Ed Opperman YouTube channel and you could subscribe there. And we have archives of all of our past shows for over the past three years, about 200, 300 shows. Uh, you can also go to the Opperman Report Spreaker channel and you can follow us there. Uh, again, a ton of shows, about 300 shows on there. And whenever we do an impromptu show, uh, an emergency type broadcast that we do during the week occasionally, you'll get an email notifying you of breaking news and spontaneous broadcasts that we may do during the week. You can also go to oppermanreport.com and become a member. If you become a member, you help support the free archives on Spreaker and YouTube, and you help support the free shows on Friday evening and on Saturday evening. Each of these shows, Friday evening and Saturday evening, are carried for free on seven internet stations, okay? Uh, so you help support that, but also, too, at OppermanReport.com in the members section, we have exclusive content. Uh, shows that are recorded during the week that are only available to members. Uh, so please check out OppermanReport.com and help support the show. The son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement, Bernie Sanders. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. Bernie moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq war, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system that holds up a rigged economy. Bernie's campaign is funded by over a million small contributions from people like you. He's fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. Bernie Sanders. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Check out strawmanmusic.com. Sean Duff is our webmaster here at the Opperman Report and uh, he's a very talented musician. He's part of a band called Strawman. They're based up there in Canada. Don't hold that against them. Uh, these are like-minded folks. If you like the shows you hear on the Opperman Report, you'll like the music that they have over at strawmanmusic.com. Enough is enough. Wall Street's greed and illegal behavior drove this country into the worst economic downturn since the 1930s. And then, after getting a huge taxpayer bailout because they were too big to fail, it turns out that three out of the four largest banks are bigger today than they were before we bailed them out. That's crazy. I'm Bernie Sanders. My plan break up the big banks who are strangling our economy and make them pay their fair share of taxes. Then we can invest in the middle class, expand Social Security, and provide universal college education. I'll rein in Wall Street behavior so they can't crash our economy again. Will they like me? No. Will they begin to play by the rules if I'm president? You better believe it. I'm Bernie Sanders, Democratic candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. You know, you can get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator, if you go to my website, emailrevealer.com. Now, this is a limited edition book, okay? And you can get a signed copy of this book, and it'll be personally autographed to you or whoever you want to give the book to as a gift. Once you have my signature on that book, you can copy the signature and put it on checks and pass them all over the world. Emailrevealer.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator. He's fought injustice and inequality his whole life. Bernie Sanders. As a college student, he was arrested for challenging segregated housing. Bernie marched with Dr. King and thousands of others for civil rights. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families on health care and jobs. Now he's taking on Wall Street banks and a corrupt political system that keeps in place a rigged economy. Bernie Sanders, a reformer who believes in ending racial profiling and mass incarceration so the justice system works for everyone. 
Bernie Sanders. There is no president who will fight harder to end institutional racism and reform our broken criminal justice system. Bernie Sanders, an honest leader building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Charity fraud is a disaster. It should not happen. And we need to find out what really happened with the Clinton Foundation. The period you're talking about, there was a trip in September of 2002 where uh, Bill Clinton decided to slap a bunch of movie actors into his plane and go through a bunch of countries. South Africa was one of them. I believe Mozambique was one. I think they might have gone to Tanzania and some other places. On a, on a week, and they got, I believe it was Jeffrey Epstein who provided his plane. All right. Now, and Epstein is a diabolical creature um, who, in the full story, is not yet really known about what was going on in his island with all these girls and why Bill Clinton would be palling around with this guy is beyond me. But the issues that, that I'm interested in are uh, when Epstein provided this plane, which he didn't just do on that trip, did he deduct that, did he claim a tax deduction? for the use of this this aircraft on his personal tax return. So that's something the IRS would know. That If he did do that, and if, and if the charity, the Clinton Foundation, accepted the free use of that plane, it's supposed to disclose that on his tax forms. And it, uh, there's no disclosure of that on the tax forms that I've found. Um, on, so on, on that's, the, 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 that's on the a practice that started in 2002. On the charity's tax forms, there's no indication that uh, this was donated. These flights. No, but but newspaper articles and other articles, magazine articles, suggest that that in fact was donated. See, now my other question is, uh, it, it's along that same lines. Now, if I give money to a charity, like I can't just make up a charity and say, "Hey, I donated fifty thousand dollars to this charity," because when I make that deduction on my tax return, it's it's going to cause <laughs> an, an investigation to see if that charity is legit, if it really exists. How come that's not going on when these big? Well, that's that was the thrust of my article. Actually, let me let me correct you on that. Okay. There, there's 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 the, some of what you say is right, but there's an even more insidious part where you're wrong. Okay. So what I've been doing, Pete, the Clintons seem to have forgotten that the major charities like the Gates Foundation, which has given it to like Mr. Mr. Eichner's charity, all have to actually report every significant grant details, who got it amount, purpose, et cetera. It's all there in the public domain. So when you cross-check what you're talking about, you know, you take $50,000 as, as the Gates Foundation and you give it to the Clinton Foundation, in the Gates Foundation report, it'll show $50,000. Then you go and you look in the Clinton Foundation, and that's a small amount for them, so it may not show up as a, as a grant, right, as an incoming grant. Uh, However, when you when I cross check the large ones, I found countless errors year by year. It's not an accident. So that's the first level of the fraud. The next level, though, is far more insidious. Here in New York, I don't know how familiar you are with what happened in New York. We had an incident of a, uh, of a homeless charity, and you couldn't go around Manhattan without seeing these white tables with these big glass jars, and in front of each table would be one or more supposedly homeless people who would you know, beg for pennies for the mm -hmm. charity. And I never understood why anybody would ask for a penny. It seems to me that you know, if you're going to ask for something, you may as well ask for a dollar. But anyway, 
they did this and it became an annoyance and people kept wondering, oh, well, is that really a charity? Well, it turns out that that was a criminal scheme. There was no such charity. And the fraudster had figured out that, you know, you could get, there are a lot of homeless people and, and, and people who like to sit in, sit in a chair and just, and they would split the money. So with these, once the internet became powerful and PayPal and other systems evolved, there's no control over, you know, when, when people give small money to a charity, they generally don't take an itemized deduction for it. Um, especially if you don't make much, then you, you don't take an itemized deduction. So yeah. this is more insidious. Here what you have is um, Internet campaigns in the case of various disasters. Who knows how much money they really raised? And there's no easy way for the IRS to check it because it's millions of people giving or tens of millions of people giving you know, 20 bucks each. And that doesn't show up. So the, a, a clever fraudster will say, this is great. You know, I've got this stream. You know, let's say a billion comes in. Nobody's checking. I don't have an auditor. I don't have independent trustees. I got a bunch of crooks around these charities anyway. We'll just say we got two million, even though we collected a billion. You know, who's going to check? That's right. And you Who's walk away with nine hundred ninety-eight million. And I guess that goes that's, into those Panama accounts that they just found recently. Well, and yeah, and and that's the thing. I mean, the, 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 there's, I was mentioning earlier to in another interview that that accountants and I, you know, I'm really a numbers nerd. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy looking at these kind of things. It's a hobby for me. And accountants actually will have written memos. One of them is called Consideration of Fraud in Financial Statement Reporting. You can Google it. And it lays out what are the warning signs for fraud. And they're all, all present here. Repeated restatements, management changes, inaccuracies, operating in corrupt countries, using fungible goods that are high value, small amounts like these HIV-AIDS drugs are small, um, and they're valuable. There's a black market in this stuff. I mean, there, there are countries in the world that, that are very prudish, and, uh, you know, they don't condone. Um, they're not, let's say, forgiving about different activities. And so in those countries, there's a black market for these, these drugs. So you, you sell them purportedly to go, let's say, into Africa, and who's to say they don't end up in the black market in Ukraine? Mm. Incredible. Now, what about uh, when, when Clinton and Bush were raising that money for the tsunami? Do, do we know where that money went? Was that part of the Clinton Foundation? Well, again, you see, the way this is supposed to work, this is, this is you know, I don't know how familiar your listeners are with Enron, but yeah. this is basically Enron in the charity world. That it, The way it's supposed to work, you're supposed to list out all of your, your affiliates, you know, every single entity, if, it, if you're going to be engaged in a different... Uh, related charity, you should list it out. You should have financial statements for that, and you should properly and fairly consolidate all those results consistently year to year. So the this, this tsunami thing started in January of 2005. Um, accounts suggest that more than $10 billion w w flowed towards people who were supposed to fix and mediate problems in the tsunami. In, in one account, Bill claims they, that they received $14 million. Uh, they talk about several different entities. There's no proper accounting for it. Then in a footnote uh, to a financial statement for uh, friends of UNICEF in the U.S., there's reference to $165 million going for those areas. But there's no real trail, no hard trail. Now, a real audit, in a real audit, an accountant would sit down with management and they'd say, all right, get, tell us the name of every legal entity you're involved with. Then they would check it. They would go and they you know, say it's this name. They go and they go to the Secretary of State in that state and they say, is there such an entity? Then they check with the Attorney General. Is it actually registered in that state? Is it federally taxed? You know, you check all this stuff. And then, then the auditor with the management would say, well, here's a list of all our contributions from the biggest down to the smallest. And the auditors would typically check all the big ones. And they contact big donor A and say, you know, how much money did you give to the Clinton Foundation in 2005? You know, and then big donor A would send them a letter. We hereby certify that we sent, you know, $16 million on such date for this purpose to this entity. That work has never been done. What about, uh, we were talking off the air about Haiti. Now, Haiti seems to be a, the, the cesspool. Because cause even, I believe, Hillary's brother has a gold mine in Haiti. 
Yeah, I mean Haiti. You know, hey, I'm not an expert on Haiti. Sure. But um, but I, I've done work, and there will be forthcoming reports on Haiti. The long history of Haiti, unfortunately, is that America, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, has a very checkered history in Haiti. You you could add into that problem that you know, there are numerous corrupt people in Haiti. But what has happened with the, the Clinton Foundation in Haiti is they started working their records suggest around 2003, again, illegally. Um, and then Bill was appointed special envoy to Haiti but in, in, in uh, 2009. And then there was this earthquake, tragic earthquake, on the 12th of January, 2010. After that moment, lots of money went towards an, an entity called the Interim Haiti Recovery Committee, Commission, rather. And Bill was made one co-chairman of it, and a former, I think, prime minister or president, whatever they call them in Haiti, was made the other co-chairman. And this entity, under Haitian law and then international practice, became the entity to which all aid-related monies were supposed to flow. But this IHRC uh, has refused. Bill Clinton, uh, they've been questioned, and there have been riots, actually, uh, demonstrations about you know, what happened to this $14 billion. Yeah. And they've refused to make an accounting of $14 billion. Now, $14 billion is a lot of money anywhere, but in Haiti, for, to give you a sense of it, I think there are roughly 10 million people in Haiti, and the total income of all of those people is less than $10 billion a year. Yeah, they make 30 so, cents an hour down there. Right, but my point is yeah. when you send $14 billion down to that country, that's, that's a, that'd be like sending you know, $22 trillion to America. Yeah. You, know, you do apples and apples. So it's, it's an outrage. That, that it would appear that what the Clintons do is any time there's a natural disaster or disaster, any chance there's an opportunity to do you know do a fundraising appeal where you slap a picture of some kid with flies buzzing around his face or a swollen belly or whatever, and we will then all look at that and say, you know, gosh, we better each send 10 bucks or 20 bucks. And besides, there's a president, former president, Bill Clinton, he's teaming with the Bushes. Of course, it's bipartisan. You can right. try. Yeah, it'll be great. And you know, there should be a special portion in hell for people like this, you know, who, who stand in front of the gigantic aid, AIDS flows that will go towards the truly afflicted p people around the world. And instead, I, I believe there's an email that's been uncovered from the, you know, the missing emails where somebody in the Clinton, in the, in the, uh, tied to the Clinton says, the gold rushes on. This is after the, uh, the earthquake hits Haiti. I mean, people, you can't, that's ridiculous. Somebody who thinks like that should be put you know, it's completely removed from ever operating in a charity. It, that, that, you know, a relief effort to aid, help these desperately poor people. I mean, they've lost their homes, their electricity, the sewer, every road's washed away, people killed. And you're going to regard that as an opportunity to start a gold mine? Yes. In, in Haiti still today, when you leave from the airport to go into the center of town, there's still rubble on the side of the roads uh, and people standing there with their hands out begging for money and no lights. Uh, right. nothing's been done in Haiti in, in all this time. Uh, well, and, and here, you know, I, I know I am picky. I, I'm well aware of the political implications of my statements, though I'm not involved in partisan politics. And, uh, you know, just because Hillary Clinton is running for president doesn't mean she can't be criticized. Here recently she said, you know, when asked what was her husband going to do, he's going to energize oh, the, the economy. U.S. economy. And give me a break. Based on what record? I mean, he energized the Arkansas economy. He energized the Haitian economy. These people have operated in Papua New Guinea, which is another place like Haiti. Uh, same story. South Africa, Mozambique, same story. Uh, India, same story. You know, this is, this is outrageous behavior. And, you know, here Bill and Ira Magaziner, his crony, uh, were both Rhodes Scholars. I mean, you know, on camp, college campuses around the world, Cecil Rhodes and, you know, the people who went into the colonies in the 19th century and earlier are excoriated for behavior that's nowhere near as bad as this. Because I mean, it was bad then, but doing it in 2016 when you should know better, you know, I mean, it's not like Bill Clinton is, is you know, a conservative Republican. I mean, he's hanging around and trying to get support, as is Hillary, from people who have studied this kind of exploitation and know that it's criminal. You know, there's no excuse for this behavior, and it's it's it needs to be exposed fully. I I think there should be not a toothless investigation. I think there should be a subpoena power, global 
investigation, not one that can be gained, that follows this to the bitter end. Any politicians that's, that's been taking money, exploiting these tragedies, should be exposed. There should be restitution made. People should go to prison. Mm -hmm. People should be barred from ever holding office of, in charity and corporate world. And, you know, this, this is just a disgusting episode that needs to be put to its end. Let me ask you a question. Now, we know that the FBI is investigating Hillary's private email server and that her IT tech guy uh, was working. I, I believe he was working for the Clinton Foundation at one point. And then they, did, they shuffled him around so that he was getting paid by the State Department. They don't even want to pay their own people. He's doing the same exact job, but now he's getting a check from the State Department. And the FBI is looking into that. Do you know anything about the FBI looking into this uh, connections? Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I'll answer the question this way. Um, I, uh, I'm not hedging. Uh, I'll just say flat out I have not either contacted or been contacted by any government, any FBI uh, person. I assume that they are watching, you know, what I put up on my website. Um, I, I was recently having a cup of coffee in a, a restaurant talking to somebody, and suddenly my phone went off berserk because it turned out that on Fox News they were focusing on what they on my work. And then Judge Napolitano, who I do know, um, said on air when asked about my work that it's great and he agrees with it. And and then he uttered this chilling sentence. He said. Uh, one thing you should know is that the FBI is, is fascinated by Charles Ortel's work. So, you know, I'm just a dude. I'm one guy. If if I can find this kind of stuff, I would hope that the FBI can follow this trail to every country where they've raised money illegally and every country where they've operated illegally and every place where they failed to disclose their important related transactions, party transactions, where people have used the Clinton Foundation to illegally enrich themselves, I hope the FBI has got a, you know, a mountain of evidence, and I hope they're going to show it to the American people. And I, you know, I hope that also our president, who is contemplating operating his own foundation come January 21, 2017. Oh, Obama's going to do this too now? <laughs> no, no. I, I hope they're going to look at this and say, you know, I had no idea that people would be this corrupt. And, of course, we have to expose it. And, of course, I will not operate my foundation this way. Yeah. And, of course, it's important. I mean, in this country, I think it's something like a seventh of all the workers in this country are somehow or another engaged in charity work. I mean, a lot of people do some great work, and they give they give them their time. They don't ask for $225,000 for a 20-minute speech. They don't make $6.4 million writing a book about mm -hmm. charity, as Bill Clinton did in 2007. You know, they don't exploit the disadvantage to, be, to, be, to get worth over $100 million in a period where – Almost all Americans are worse off today than they were in 2000. You know, they, when you look at it, just things for inflation and stuff. Everybody's worse off except the Clintons, who were homeless in 2000, now have two mansions. And how do they justify this wealth? Through the great work of their foundation, which is not independently run, has never been audited, and where it seems that lots of money is missing. Uh, real quick, now you said very carefully that you have not been contacted by the FBI. Have you contacted the FBI and submitted any information to the FBI? I have not. Uh, I, have, I have not contacted the okay. FBI. I have contacted certain state governments, and I'm about to contact more, and I'm going to about to contact uh, some international governments, but not the. Uh, the FBI is a very powerful organization. I mean, they, they have a lot of people. Uh, I know a retired FBI person who's got his own private investigator service. I'm, I'm not. I'd be very happy to talk to the FBI. I'm surprised they haven't contacted me. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I figure I'll just do this in the public domain and let them do their work. I mean, the level of work I'm doing is just what's available to the public. The FBI could go in and say, "I want to see all your records. I want to see every board minute meeting. I want to see all correspondence with donors. I want to see everything." And a public charity has to keep its records. You're not, you can't be destroying records, and it's a burden of proof uh, once the IRS gets souped up, as it did against conservatives in certain instances. The, the, the charity has to defend that it is legally constituted. They have to provide, make the arguments. Not, they don't, you don't wait for the IRS to ask the questions. The charity has to come forward and say, no, 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 we're validly organized. Here's our board minutes. Here's this. Here's that. Okay, we're running out of time, so real quick, one last question. Do you have any, have you noticed any indications of big donations going into the Clinton Foundation? Then Hillary made a decision in the State Department to give favors to, to anybody? 
I have not been focused on that, but okay. Peter Schweitzer has. Okay. Okay, we're, we're pretty much out of time. So what, what do you want to leave us with, and how can people get a hold of you? Well, I would appreciate it if, if people would go to my site, www.charleshortel.com. If there are foreign governments or foreign journalists, particularly in Ireland and South Africa, uh, please reach out to me. I can give you a lot of information to help. I think that Mr. Hearn and what happened in 2003 forward in Ireland needs to be investigated. I think what happened with the Clinton Foundation in South Africa needs to be investigated with people on the ground in those countries. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Charles, uppercase C, or tell, uppercase O. Um, I do my best to try to respond. In my site, you can contact me through the site. Uh, I, I can't guarantee I'll respond to everybody, but I try to. And if you like my work, please circulate it. Charles Ortel, I cannot thank you enough. This is this is the kind of stuff my audience loves. Okay, real detailed facts. As a matter of fact, if you have any kind of documents you want to share, we'll put them up on the website. Um, I can't thank you enough. And you got to promise me, soon as you well, you got any kind of breaking news, I'll put you on the air the same day. Okay, so you, you got to promise. You stay in touch with me. Okay. I uh, will. Thanks so much for reaching out, Charles Ortel. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. Okay, guys, there you got it. Okay, great, 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 great information. Charles Ortel, charlesortel.com. His Twitter is Charles Ortel. Oh, boy, I really like that kind of stuff. And I am fascinated about how deep this goes with the Clinton Foundation. Okay. Speaking of donations, <laughs> okay. don't forget operamentreport.com. Uh, uh, we're trying to uh, get out to California next week to do some filming, our first documentary film. We are so close to getting there. You have no idea. Um, GoFundMe slash Opperman Report to donate toward. It's an equipment fund uh, so that we can purchase a, a really good video camera and a still camera. Uh, we're really close on that. Uh, a direct PayPal donation, PayPal to Opperman Report at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, any kind of funds coming toward us right now? There's a lot of stuff you need when you when you're filming a documentary. You got to buy some shirts, you know. I got to buy decent shirts. You need a haircut, you know. You got, you know, these are things to, you got to take into consideration, you know. And then also too, um, you know, gas to get over there, you know, lodging. I got Vic with me. Uh, also too, just to become a member, become a member at OppermanReport.com. You sign up as a member, even if it's just for one month for six bucks, for just this month. If we could just get like 50 people, 100 people to, to just for this month, okay? I'm, I'm sure once you start, you'll get addicted because everybody gets hooked on the shows. But if you can come in, OppermanReport.com, and just sign up for one month, then when I go to California and I come back, and, you know, I got some money over there because it takes 30 days to get that money. I got some money there to pay the rent when I get back. You follow? So you, you can really get this going. Our next stage of growth with this show. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Charles Ortel. O-R-T-E-L at charlesortel.com.